you know, there was a law that said the surveyors was there that if uh, if a stream was navigable, and he defined navigability as being just so long as the stream retained an average width of 30 feet. Right. They had to, they said no survey shall cross it. Right. So they had to make a determination right then and there, am I going to cross this stream or not? So navigability was determined at the time the original survey was there. And uh, and they said if it is a navigable stream, and you're going up to it, you're going to front one half square water front on that stream. In other words, a, a mile square section on the half mile front on the stream. And uh, so uh, uh, most of the time you can look at the land office map and, uh, and tell right off the bat whether they consider this stream an or not. And, but but uh, I, I think one of the harder things to do sometimes is to actually determine whether a stream is a natural stream or whether or not uh, it's just a, a drain flow uh, in there. And, uh, and those, those type things you see under the civil law, it doesn't have to be 30 feet wide. It's a natural stream and it flows more or less all year from year to year as a perennial stream. Uh, it was retained by the sovereign and that belongs to the state, whether it be three feet wide or 30 feet wide. And, uh, after the, uh, the Republic of Texas came about, they defined it as being 30 feet wide. So uh, uh, there again, you get into a little gray areas, yeah, yeah. Which, which create the special knowledge that surveyors need to have in order to make these decisions. Well, back to the gradient boundary, uh, <coughs> these styles and Kidder, they spent three years up here on the Red River, right? They did, and on the ground, in the field, and, and we are, are very privileged to own a, a, a portion, at least, of Colonel Stiles' records, and we have a lot of the manuscripts where he actually hand wrote out his thoughts and all this sort of thing. We also have his copy of the Supreme Court decree to these surveyors telling them, giving them instructions on what they wanted them to do. And he had uh, his copy and at the top he wrote, he was very meticulous, he wrote, this is my copy that I carried in the field. And I mean it's creased over, you can tell where he had it in his pocket and his notes throughout it, handwritten notes. And we've shared that in, as we teach uh, seminars, we put it in people's hands because right. we just think it's pretty right. neat, you know. But they, what they did ultimately in studying the streams was to determine that the thing they kept seeing on the banks, the Supreme Court has said we want it on the bank, they saw where uh, as the stream flowed it would build up accretion banks, dump the alluvian and build the banks. So what they determined was it was this low accretion bank that was going to be the bank that would define the river and then they, they consistently were able to get a measurement on the toe or the bottom basically where the riverbed becomes the bank at that toe and then the entrance and then the gradient boundary is midway between those two measurements and it, it really is advantageous to the upland owner in that uh, instead of being up on the top bank or something, it's down. It's about midway, so it's an advantage to an upland owner. So once a qualified bank is established on any uh, river under this process that these guys develop, gradient pr boundary process, then that grade can be perpetuated along the strip of property being surveyed and you can actually fix a property line for that period of time as because as you were stating uh, rivers and, and riparian uh, streams that are determined navigable change their course over time and as the course changes so changes the boundary so when you guys do a gradient boundary you're establishing that gradient boundary for a specific period of time. Is that correct? That's true, uh, but practically it doesn't change. Right. Yeah. At the outer line of, a, of any river bed, there is a bank that contains the river. Mm -hmm. It may be this high, right? or it may be 150 feet high, but it is at the outer line of the river bed, and it is the bank that contains the river in its normal flow. The gradient boundary is along that bank. 
we can walk out to most any river you want to go to and walk out there and, and, and get within uh, a foot or two of the Great Valley without going through the process of uh, finding uh, this. See, the, all the Great Valley really does is draw a line along the bank. The bank, the, the Great Boundary in style says that the Great Boundary is along this bank. And, uh, and, and it's just drawn a line along along the bank. It's kind of like going up a chalk line along this wall out here. Right. And uh, so uh, once, once you see that uh, if you start walking across a dry riverbed, and when you get to that outer line of that riverbed, there's going to be a bank out there you can crawl up on it. And uh, if it had water in it, you'd be waiting until you got there, you see. Right. But uh, uh, in, uh, in East Texas, where the, the water, is, is styles in his word says, is the water is everywhere along the bank. In other words, you got a big flowing river, and when you get to the bank, you will walk off into water. But he says that on the Red River, uh, some places the water is a quarter of a mile away from there. That's right. And so, uh, uh, but it's still a bank out there that contains the river. And of course, uh, we got uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of different opinions along that line, but but uh, but actually, uh, the gradient boundary is along that bank out there, and then you go out there and pick it her web, and Ray Wisdom and I pick the banks all up and down the Canadian River for states and well locations, and then finally when we came back and ran the gradient boundary, our gradient boundary was right there along that bank. This gradient boundary that was derived over this uh, Red River uh, study by Kidder and Stiles, were there other states that have adopted the gradient boundary as a boundary between uh, rivers or between properties? No, but we were uh, privileged to work with the Bureau of Land Management with some of their surveyors. And they were, uh, the question was a correlation between gradient boundary and ordinary high water, which is not always easy to establish. They've got ordinary low water, ordinary high water. And so we worked together with those elements, uh, actually on the Red River. And that was pretty interesting in that, that what we uh, discovered is that, uh, that ordinary high water is not so very far off from the gradient boundary. And is ordinary high water what's used in some of these, in most other states? In, yes, in the western states. In the western states. states. Ordinary, right. ordinary low water is used in, the, in a lot of the eastern states. Wow. And see, that's a that's an invisible boundary there. Mm -hmm. Because if it's ordinary low water, it means half the amount of water is above it. Right. And so the, uh, the, water, the boundaries are underwater. That's the same thing true on the mean high water. Mm -hmm. It's average high water and half the time, considering you're saying that, the water's going to be over it. And it's going more than that because this tide gauge that you're using out there is taken in the stilling well, which meters out uh, or, or, or uh, the all the meteorological yeah, action. Right. And, right. and so a lot of many times, the water that reaches the shore is two, two feet higher than what it's measuring out here in the tide gauge. So it means that at, three, at more than three-fourths of the time, that uh, the boundary you're staying out on in high water is, is out from, is underwater. Wow. I think it's crazy. I don't like it at all. We do it all the time, but uh, because it's the law. Right. But uh, uh, it's the tail wagging the dog. Right. 